Um, so we we'll start in M. Carlos Munoz Costa. Um, my background is landscape architecture. So I have been working since my, my diploma in Germany in the interaction between urban development and nature in the city. This was always my connection, trying to bring, to keep bringing nature more to the cities, our environment. And uh, nature, like, uh, land, like landscape, like the environment, it's a common good. It's uh, something that belongs to each one of us. It's the same with cultural heritage. It's a common good, it belongs to everyone, and everyone should be, uh, ha have the right to talk about it, to share it, to embody it. Uh, presentation so, so usually uh, control F. Not it's fine because I think it's uh, okay. Uh, if you want to, doesn't work. Okay, we go in this way. I think it should be presentation mode, but doesn't work. <laughs> Yes, I can hear my voice. Okay, perfect. It's always yeah. like that <laughs> with technical development. It's very interesting, but sometimes it's also uh, it's good to be here with you to to be in the same room to to see you face to face. Technology is improving, but it's not uh, the egg. It's not the end of the day. So my, my speech, my, uh, my intention is to share with you some, some ideas. As Giuseppe mentioned, I am coordinating or I'm in the head of a working group that we are working in two different levels of um, how to make the cultural heritage a common good in the center of the community, how to put it forward that people can value it and share it. And we have a ways to, to check what are the legal framework, what are the regulations, what are the laws that we have to follow. And these are mostly a jacket. We have to follow that to, to come to, to a, what we call activating um, urban uh, built heritage, uh, underground built heritage. So we have to follow the role, the, the, the laws, the policies, the strategies of the government, of the uh, regional uh, government, of the cities, but also from international ones. So from the European Union, from the uh, UNESCO. So there is a lot of regulations. And, but this is the common work, the common uh, approach, but we want to try a new way of working on that. It is what we call this informal uh, planning policies or informal planning methods. We want to go a different way. We don't want to go forward to having a plan that is able to be approved, but a, a long way. It's not usually longer than the other one because here we can talk to people and uh, check how people will understand what we are planning. So it's not, it doesn't take longer. It's just a different way. In the end, we will have to come to, the, do, to do the, the legal framework because there is no point if you develop a very nice idea, but it's not uh, able to be approved. It's not able to be financed. 
So we are just trying to keep uh, uh, this idea and try different ways. So what we want to connect is what we call local knowledge, the knowledge that people have in the area that live, that uh, uh, embody, that create that uh, heritage. And combine this with scientific knowledge. You haven't been here the, the last days. We don't have the answers, but maybe together, putting together the local knowledge and the scientific knowledge we have, you have, maybe you can pose the right questions. If we have the right questions, so a good part of the work is already done. So then we can fix and we can uh, have the past much easier to develop the ideas. So our intention is to combine local knowledge with scientific knowledge. So the other point is uh, wisdom of the crowd. I guess it's easy to understand. Two heads think more than one, four heads think more than two. So if we put all people to work together in the same, in the same paths, in the same issue, so we have more, maybe more knowledge, more, um, yeah, more ideas. So then we can tailor our ideas, our results better to the, to the situation, the local situation. So it's not something that is, can be put everywhere, but it's more tailored, it's more locally uh, situated and tailored then to local culture and the environment. So we want also to embed these ideas in the community, in the, uh, in the institutions, in the practice that people that created that, uh, this uh, asset and use the relationships we have. So what we want is that we don't create anything for someone that will consume it as a user, but we want to produce something with these people to be co-producers. And this is uh, the next uh, approach we have. So what we want to do is make a process that's community lead. So the community works very hard on it or works on it, but it, it has the, the support of the government. So it's government feed. So the government gives us the resources, the information, the data, and everything that we need to to make the process community lead. It's this combination for us is very interesting. And this way we can get to the, what we call transition management. So for an asset that's not value now, it's reading or it's not too well set in the, in, the, um, in the area to something that is activated. That's something that has value for the community, has value for the country, has value for the whole uh, cultural asset. So what we want to ask you is really to think out of the box. We don't need uh, conventional solutions, but maybe something different. And this is for sure, we need creativity. We need people that are able to think out of the box, uh, look for solutions that are innovative, but somehow also fit to the culture and the situation. So we used to, to have, I think this is a very, nice process, three main issues, three main steps, and to come to a result. The three, three main steps are citizen science. I put here in the blue, this is the main, um, let's say, over uh, associations or uh, European um, groups that had developed this further, this idea. Citizen science, living labs, in co-creation. So we, when, we use the, the knowledge, the local knowledge. We have a citizen science. If we involve the local people, we come together in a laboratory, the living labs to try to think, to develop. So try ideas and make these ideas a co-production. So we co-create value. So at the end of what we have, what is we call place making. So we make this asset be it a park, a park or a green space or a cultural asset, it's a place because this is the difference between space and place. When people put values on that, uh, give them an asset, this asset, a value, then it's a place. So what we want to, to reach at the end is 
places. So people value and people put their efforts on that. So share these values. So in the end, what we want is to activate this uh, cultural asset. So just very briefly, what is the concept, these three concepts had in, uh, behind them. So citizen science is, is, is um, now is one of the pillar of the European Union research program. We have to involve lay people, local people in our research. It's something very good, I like that, because as I mentioned, we don't have the answers, but maybe together we can pose the right questions. So that means citizen science is to involve the concerned community. We have been here the last two days, who is this community, how we involve them. So I don't want to go deep on that, but uh, um, it's very important that we take away, uh, keep always in mind that the community is someone, any person that create, develop, holds and preserves the knowledge. So can be a know-how how to use material, uh, building material, can be a know-how how to use plants, or can be a know-how how to use, like here, to make this uh, uh, from the stones, houses or churches. So this know-how is very important. So the lab, the living labs, this is also one of pillar of the research in Europe. So when we, involve pe people, we have to give them a good framework to work together. So the best way I think is, is the organizing these living labs. You are experiencing them here. We give information, we give some inputs, but in the end we come together and work, experiment some solutions. And this I think is also very important that we start a process of thinking about the, the common goods, about the value of the cultural heritage, about the landscape, about the environment. And this builds the, the knowledge as well and uh, give people more competences and skills. Co-creation is, again, is um, um, an approach that made from business, a jump it into planning. So it's also everywhere, it's um, a jargon. But if when we give this uh, uh, good impact, a uh, uh, good um, when we give this uh, really a chance to work, it's a, a good process because people can co-create the, the results or the environment or the ideas. So what we need here is a collective um, creativity, put think, people to think together. <clears throat> So this, this both sides has some, for sure, some um, uh, requirements. So if we look from, from the political side, from the framework, so someone in the, the government, be it the city, the regional government, the ministry, someone has to accept that the other groups are thinking about the, the problem, about the asset or about the environment. So they have to value these local actions. So they have to recognize or acknowledge that these people is existing. They are doing something to, to, to help them. They have in this way to support intersectorial synergies. This is a, a, big, a big issue when you, you talk to municipalities because it's still there is the thinking that's okay, this is cultural. Okay, this has nothing to do with environment. Environment has not to do with urban development. So. This, this is still a very, a very um, uh, issue when you work, work with the communities or uh, government. And they have to accept it. They have to share responsibility. They are not anymore the owners of the, uh, of the truth, but they have to accept that someone else is taking uh, responsibility on that. So on the, from the other side, from the local initiatives or the local action, so it's important they maintain or keep their independence. They are not uh, put in the, in the jacket of, the, of the, uh, the planning issues. They have to invest in co-responsibility. Once we start the thinking, so we, we have to be able to, ask, to accept and uh, uh, take some responsibilities as well. So the other uh, issue I like very much is the, we bring in the laboratories and co-creation laboratories, we bring people to talk together, 
to talk. This is already a big issues in this in the uh, in the government when you bring people just to talk together, to be together and talk. This is also um, a very important issue. I I know that this is um, not a very nice English, but it comes to the point. Two for talking. So we bring people to sit together and, and say table and talk. And this is already a very uh, huge issue. And then they have to be able to mobilize the community, not to, to be able to uh, enlarge the community, to involve more people, different people, different with different interests. So if we check it, this, uh, these requirements, it's not new. So it's already there in different uh, situations, different uh, uh, government uh, strategies. And I, I just was just checking here from the agenda 21 from, from the 90s. This was already there, the requirement to create uh, partnerships and together uh, um, make the analysis. What, what are not our needs? What we have? Where do we want to go? This, community lead uh, approach is already there in the 90s and together develop uh, solutions or develop ideas to, to the pathway. For sure, there is other, other uh, uh, steps that we cannot go together here, like the implementation, the evaluation, the feedback, but they are there. So this is not a not new uh, call. So what we need when we bring you here to work together, to sit together, to talk, is your curiosity to experiment. We have to be open to be uh, to willing to experiment, to create different situations. So, and this is an open-end process. We don't need to have the results that tomorrow will be uh, discussed in the, in the seat uh, assembly. But we need ideas that can put us a step further in making the cultural goods or a common goods really a part of the community. So it, this means it's a continuous process. We start here, but we don't end here. And so again, we have been discussing, we don't have the receipt. You don't expect for us to have a tick list. You can go and say, okay, this is done, this is done, this is done, I'm finished. This is a process we are learning together. So what do we give you? It's a framework, we give you some tools that has to be chosen according to, to the situation, local situation, according to, to your needs or the needs of the community. I like to show this, uh, these uh, slides as well, because here it's very clear who we should involve in the process. This is, uh, again, it came from, from business. They say, uh, or this is also a, a requirement now for research projects for funding from the European Union. We have to involve business. We have to involve research. We have, we have to involve public administration and this uh, civil society. They call here users. This is not, it's not used anymore. But uh, you know, these are the, the main, the four main users group or stakeholders group we have always to develop. And we have seen yesterday from the manager of the hotel, is when I, I think it was very interesting because she brought us the view of the business. So the, the hotels have to survive here. They have to provide uh, jobs and uh, revenue. So she brought nice ideas. This quadruple helix has been, has been already developed by the same uh, research, by the same authors. They just put here the environment. The environment is now the 50, of, uh, the 50 part of it. But for me, like um, being a landscape architect all, all my professional life, the environment was always there. The environment was always the basis. So this remains the same, but for the business, they are discovering that the, they have to take care now about the environment. Environment is a common good. We have to keep it if you want to survive. So this, just to, to, to show you, this call is also, embedded in the, the uh, historical urban landscape approach. So we need to involve the local people. We want to, to develop uh, planning tools that are not uh, fixed, so to be more creative. And, but we have to come back again 
to regulatory tools or systems. So at the end, we have to come back to close the circle and what I showed in the first, uh, the first slides. Uh, let uh, come here. So in the end, we have to come here. Oh, it doesn't move. Oh, yeah. Uh, even if you are very creative, in the end, we have to, to follow the legal regulations if you want to teach, at least in the legal form. Uh, so the question is always who evolve, how to evolve these people, what are their values, how you can offer them. But I guess once we started the program, and we as good planners, we will get this, this sensitivity to involve people to, I think one of the big uh, um, requirements we have is to be able to hear, to listen to people and transform this information we get in something that everyone can make use of. This. And it's always very important to keep people working for you, working in the group how you can manage that people keep interested in the, in the process in participating. Because the way people participate and how who participated changes also the results. So if you do the same, the same idea with different people, you, for sure you get a different results. So the, the lab modified the results, but the people that participate in the lab also modified the, the, the uh, the results. So what we want to have is some, someone that's taking part in this transition, uh, taking this transition. So you don't go alone, but with community. And we <clears throat> haven't been heard about uh, tools that um, uh, Lola, I think in the first day presented the uh, stakeholders mapping. This is a good tool to to try to recognize, to understand what is the needs of people first, and then how we can involve them in the, the solution. And one thing this is always uh, very important. I don't think people have to be trained to participate. We as planner need to be sensitive enough to listen to people because once they are trained, as they say, they will say, will say mostly the same thing they, the others. So we don't want to have always the same opinion. So for me, it's very much more important to, to bring people in. We try to listen to them and not to train them to participate because they will get the skill anyway. The more the people participating in uh, labs, the more they, they, can, they, they are able to, to talk and to um, uh, share their ideas. Just to, again, um, this is a list of the 10 principles from the uh, European uh, Association for uh, Citizen Science. I don't want to go them there, but the sixth one is very important for us. It says that it's just uh, living labs, co-creation. Citizen science is just another tool. It's not, a, a, how do you call that, a wonder portion. It's not, it's not something wonderful that it will solve all problems. It's just a tool. So it has limitations, it has problems, but it has something positive. For this reason, we are using them. We don't go for, uh, uh, this, is the, this is the solution. This is uh, it's not what we want. So we have to recognize also the limitations of these tools. So <clears throat> for us, it's very interesting that uh, two points. We inspire people to participate in what we call progressive uh, peace making, that people are able to participate and share their knowledge and their ideas. And then for us, as planners, as uh, researchers, it's very important that we take some lessons from this process and we can inform policy making so that we can push for policy changes. If you want to close this cycle again, so the legal framework we have to provide evidences for, for policy making that it's needed to change something in the legal framework. And this is the, the best way. We bring uh, evidence from this research and inform policy, uh, policy makers. 
So this is, we close again this, this article. So uh, two examples where we try to do this, to bring the knowledge, local knowledge, um, and to see how, how it works in the analyzing, people analyzing or valuing the uh, underground heritage. One paper I was involved is about reusing salt mines in Romania, Portugal, and Poland. There are three different countries. The mines are, we analyze in each country one mine, a salt mine, a mountain salt. And uh, they have a different, uh, um, they are in different stages of use. In Romania, it's already 10 decades, uh, a decade that we stopped the production. In Poland, it's still in production, but it's already changed. In Portugal, it's on production. They are, the mines are changing now to involve people letting people know what is the, the salt production. And we use these ideas to, to try to understand what is the heritage tourism, how we can use these assets to bring tourists, tourists to these places. And uh, one of the, the, the I, I guess, one of the main uh, knowledge we gain that is that branding the city with salt means is something positive because it brings tourists and uh, <clears throat> change the, the, changes also the image of the region. This was very easy to be seen in Poland. In Poland, there is huge cities that live only from salt, from mines. And this, this changing the, the use of the mines is also changing the branding of the city. So the other chapter, uh, we, I wrote with the colleagues from the working group four, Tatiana is here. Uh, we, Check it, how we can use, how cities are using underground assets to evaluate them, to bring people to know them. We analyze five examples. I tell you about the examples we use in Lisbon. In Lisbon, we have a, a subway system. And uh, at the beginning, people are afraid of using it because it's, it's from the 70s, it's dark, it's not, uh, it's not colorful. So, but in Portugal, we have also the, the um, the uh, details, you know, these uh, small pieces of, it's very known, it's a knowledge of the country. So the municipality or the owner of the, the subway station started to invite uh, artists and produce tales, and they made these stories on that. So what the idea was how to bring, to make this underground heritage that's dark, it's, uh, it's not very inviting, more familiar to people. So tales is the best way for that because we see tales in everywhere in Lisbon, everywhere in Portugal. So in the way how the municipalities also communicated this process was analyzed. So uh, it's very interesting to see that uh, dialogues is very important for sure. So how the municipalities communicate to that. And there are good examples and bad examples in the cases. Lisbon was not the best example because the municipality just produced the tales, put the details in the in the in the subways, and uh, didn't inform people. So people mostly didn't know about the the idea. So communicating is also a very important process. So we have to do something good, but we have also to communicate to people, inform people that we are doing that. So for this reason, I think in the whole process, there are three main actors, uh, three main drivers. First, people, people, the community, people that live that, that created this asset, that uh, share this asset. Second one, I call that planners. People that are able to create good ideas, create innovative ideas, people that uh, are able to communicate this, these ideas one side, so good, create good solutions. In the order, we need also politicians that take these ideas into the agenda, the political agenda, into the budget of the city that we can make transformation. So in this process, three drivers are very important. So people that for them, we do any work, good planners that create something new, innovative and also locally uh, situated, innovative with good solutions, and decision makers that take these ideas 
up to the um, political agenda. So with this, here are the references I used. And with this, I'm come to the end. Thank you for your attention. I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Carlos, uh, for the presentation. And uh, you know, before uh, coming to you for the question, I always have a comment being a planner. And uh, so Carlos pointed out a very important sensitive element in this story, the role of the planner. Let's be clear. Normally, a good planner is the one that uh, it arrives to, to do the plan as soon as possible. Mm. But uh, this type of process uh, brings a lot of time. What happens? So from the ethical point of view for the planner, the performance is more important uh, of involving people? Not always. So one first point is the ethical uh, responsibility of the planner. So I'm not so convinced that the planner alone has this power and we need teams of planners, people, mm -hmm. different people, and I'm not always... Okay, I am moved. Sorry, I'm also okay. Great. So this is the first point that you comment, Carlos. Then, then there's another point. point. The planner is a wonderful manipulator. manipulator. Hmm. So, so also when, when we listen, listen people, people, we transform according to our construction of meaning, because, because we are very structured, structured. we are very, very used to deal with different disciplines, and normally it is another very, very weak point of the planners, we create another reality than not, not the people reality. reality. Yeah. So, so this is another thing that we have to do a step back. So they are first to step back, first the ethical one, and second one, not manipulating people, obliging us not being the deus ex machina of the plan, because this was our education. We learned this when we went to school and we studied for planners, uh, our target was to create the master plan. Mm. Point. And we need the answers. We should know the answers. And we should know the answers, otherwise we are not good planners. Yeah. So, so there, there are two ethical problems, two main, main problems, problems when we do this. And then, then I don't know, when you saw, so, uh, Carlos was very, is very wonderful in synthesis. So he, he pointed out these people that you know that it doesn't exist at all. So we have no people, we have stakeholders. We have different <laughs> actors sometimes uh, uh, consociating themselves, agreeing. And creating, the, I was uh, when I when I was teaching conflict resolution in the 90s, I was telling the perfect consensus. You yeah, create a consensus between three stakeholders. For example, the politicians, the financial side, and the criminality. The, everybody is happy <laughs> from that side, but somebody is going to pay for all of them. So you have always to look at the missing stakeholder. And so when you put people, people doesn't say anything because you can have people, but some people is not represented, it has no voice. The empowerment problem is the main problem and you cannot solve very easily. When we do secret and science, so we have another problem. Basically, it's the problem of people. So how to involve many citizens in testing, in experimenting? Because for us also, it's very more productive when we do tests to invite friends, the friends of the friends. I was involved in, uh, in testing a new type of mobilities, transport mobilities. So for us, when I arrived at the university, the way of doing tests is, uh, do you want to have an electric car? You test for one year. The other one, and all our university colleagues, they have a car and they were testing. It was a very, very limited segment of people, it was not really citizen science. So I spent one year to convince my university that we have to do something different. One year. So, and I, I didn't open to the world. I went to the specific type of community, the housing community, I gave them the cars. It was an experiment of citizen science. I had uh, every three 
plans, the questionnaires, uh, meeting people, uh, they became more expert than me and managing these experiments. And that was uh, Carlos is saying about citizen science. It is a challenge. Normally, the regime, when we, you remember my figure, we have this kind of, uh, let's say, a circle in the middle between the niche and environment. The regime tries to be conservative, tries to block any kind of innovation. The work that you have to do, you have to skip the regime also. And then we go back to Carlos in the planning approach. We have statutory planning and we are never go against the statutory planning because it's the basis. Yeah. But statutory planning doesn't say anything and today doesn't provide money. Mm -hmm. Because the big game today is they do plans, but they have no budget for the plans. Every municipality, every place has this kind of crisis. And we work for, for crisis. When, when we do transitions, transitions it's, it's, I, I told you sometimes, sometimes I was in the previous meetings, is because you have a crisis. Without crisis, everything goes well. Nobody is going to change the system. Nobody is going to change the environment. You have to find the crisis. If you find the crisis and they need a solution, you provide a solution. So you create a possibility to have a niche where you can experiment solutions. And when you have a plan, normally, you know, for many years in Italy, for example, we work on strategic plans, voluntary, non-statutory, because it was a way to overcome the, uh, the length of the planning process. We do some uh, five years uh, strategic plans and we proceed. But then each of the action prepared in the plan, they need in the strategic plan, they need to be formalized, legitimized by some planning tool. So, or you go with the progress. And then it came, so you, so you, I was uh, yesterday with you in the bus and we saw what happened in, uh, in Cyprus. Because uh, they do a uh, road, they build a road, and then uh, strangely, uh, agricultural land becomes residential land without mm -hmm. any kind of real planning. Only because we have a bylaw <coughs> saying that you don't need to build more than, you cannot build more than three floors. And then you do the residence without any regulation. So, what is very important when we do this is that we need to legitimate correct decision making. We, make, we, we work for the transparency of the process. Mm. So we need to search for the ones that in this case, they are losing something and we have to involve them. It's a sort of way we can say active citizenship. I would like to say that we are not doing the planners in this case, but we are stimulating, facilitating the citizenship. And then we are trying to collect because we, we know how to manipulate a different kind of disciplines. <laughs> we try to collect the different experts from different fields and we ask them, please give me some reasons to, to go in that direction or in the other direction. That's, that's my comment, but I left the floor to- But to one, one comment to that, I use people on purpose because the stakeholder from the beginning from this world Someone that holds the stake, someone that holds something high, so it shows out already that is a leader, someone that will guide some the others in the process. For this reason, I think people with most. Uh, I understand. Yeah. You, you does for tactical, you do for tactical reasons, yeah. but you know, then the, we need to provide. As yeah, much for as sure. Possible the real target of our action, yeah. otherwise. Yeah, for sure, we need that, that ones that can lead the others. But uh, in the beginning, I would say we need people. We, need, we, don't, we don't Very, very that. simple example. Normally, you find a good agreement from the business side. And also from the environmental side, there is not, nothing special, but maybe something is missing. In Cyprus, maybe. Cultural side has been very really considered. Let's go to see the cultural components of the society. What do they think about that? Let's go to stimulate them. Let's go to invite them. That is a sort of living lab because they are not involved. Maybe they are not aware of what is happening. They will discover ex post because they are being informed at the, at the end of the process. 
let's ask, try to involve them since not to the beginning, but since the moment that we discover it. So it's, it's a tactical. When, I, when the Carlos uh, speaks about uh, planning, it's about how to strategically involve communities in, in doing something that can be the right choice for the decision maker. Okay, uh, right choice can be also very questionable. <laughs> yes, but, you know, choice, course, wrong, yeah. choices can be right and wrong, then we yeah. evaluate them, and then yeah. we do this evaluation ex post. But... We should uh, ask for questions, we should have yeah. some comments. Questions? Yes. Don't decide. Carlos is here. Yeah, I can answer also in coffee break. Yes, we have a few questions. Uh, Rita also. Please. I will first give a gentleman. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, there you are. Uh, okay, thank you, Carlos, for this great presentation. I will take off my mask. Uh, I just wanted to ask you for from your personal opinion. How hard is to talk with decision makers? So you do everything. Mm. And how hard is to approach them and to not not to say make them hear you, but to not even convince is not the right word, but if you, if you understand what I mean, yeah, I do, yeah. uh, to, to change something, something, for example, if they think that the thing that they're doing is working as it is, how hard is to change their opinion? It's very hard, first, because <laughs> I think we, as I'm also a researcher, we have a very huge baggage. We want to put everything, change everything, but we have to always put it in pieces. You know, people from from um, decision makers they need the information very synthesized in pieces. They don't want to, to understand the world. They want just to change this. If you if you succeed to put this information in such a way that they can understand. And they can use them, this is perfect. So that means you have to go step by step, not everything, change everything. And I think it's very important to the moment. I don't know in other cities, but in Lisbon, we have uh, the administration changing. New people are coming to the administration. These new people, younger than me, they are able to understand much better because they are not so fixed in their their position. I don't know in the other cities, but this in Lisbon is, is interesting because it's open for us new opportunities. You know, young people, they are more able to understand to, because they are not so fixed in the system. So, and I think it's also changing in the way we are learning about planning. We don't have, a, we don't say we need a master plan, we need, a, we need to provide an answer, but we need to to see the way and to see the light in the end of the tunnel. And this is already good. Yeah. Yeah. We were talking uh, how, for example, young people, as you told us, have great um, ideas, but uh, sometimes they get to a wall that, some, that people mm -hmm. don't want to listen to them, what they uh, have to uh, say and what they have to let's say, teach us, for example, because uh, from my personal experience, um, people, they think that they, with some people, so not generalized, they, uh, they know everything. So yeah. it is really hard to, to change their opinion just in order uh, to, not to make them listen to you, but to hear what you have to say, and then to start the process uh, everything. And besides that, I think your second point is that mostly politicians know everything, or they think they know everything. They, they don't see the need to change anything. This is also very hard, because they don't see the need to change things that are working. So this is, has been always done in this way. Why to change now? Yeah, this is hard. But uh, I think at the moment it's good because people are more aware about the environment, about cultural heritage than ever. If you see the results of the, in Germany, the elections, the Green Party won it. And it's our young people that are involved now. I think this is a good situation. I came from a country that is the opposite from Brazil. We have, uh, so 
I don't speak about that, but uh, you know, there is there is good points as well. So yes, yeah. thank you. I really like that uh, line where you need yeah. to. It's not linear, so you have to hear uh, everybody and yeah. their opinion and to include everything. So. It want to be linear in a way, so we have a ways to to be able to to move, change, move again, rethink it again. So yeah. thank you. Your comments. Okay. <laughs> uh, thanks for your presentation for your speech. Uh, I have a comment in your very last slide. You put the planners, people, and decision makers, and there is some. Uh, it's called uh, 9P expanded. Sorry. Planners and co. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. There is, uh, <laughs> there is a 9P marketing mix. Mix. It was established by Larry Lawrence. He's a U.S. Uh, expert for marketing, and it says 9P, people, planning, product, price, promotion, place, partners, presentation, and passion. So everything is connected with the people. people. Yeah. So, so the people, people should, should have the main role in tourism and in heritage industry at all. Yeah, but if you see my, my yeah, graph, yeah, people is the biggest. Yeah, 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 of course, because the people are yeah, uh, they are acting the main role. Yeah, they, they are doing everything for one of course. For and people. in that sense, I think that we really need this live presentation to to be really in all these uh, making strategies, strategies with live laboratories, with brainstorming. But it is very important to be uh, connected with the local community. Yeah, yeah. Sure. So not this nine P marketing. I don't know that. Could, but... uh, could help us maybe. Yeah, I don't know that. But if you share the link. Yeah, yeah, I will. I will. Don't worry. Yeah, because it's it's, very I don't know that. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Thanks. But yeah, just, just a comment. In marketing, I don't know. Marketing could be also very. Uh, you know. Yeah. yeah. Marketing. Tricky. Tricky. Yeah. yeah it, it could, could be, be tricky. tricky. Yeah, I'm very worried about people. <laughs> when when I won this action, I was uh, warned by the Pontifical Commission of Sacred Archaeology from Rome, from the Pope, and they warned me that uh, don't give to the people the platforms. <laughs> <laughs> also, it could be a trick. Thanks. Okay, we have Anissa, the question, and then we have a coffee break. So, we can talk on the coffee break. Hello. Hi. Hi. Thank you for your presentation. Uh, you mentioned the co-create value, and uh, we mentioned also the brand. So, is it possible to co-create value with uh, the private actors, and uh, how? I, I guess, guess yes. We have the best example yesterday. Yes. The lady from I can Maria, Maria from from the hotel. Mm -hmm. She's a private person. She's interested. I, I found this very amazing that she as hotel manager is interested in in developing the image of this area because usually they want to solve their products. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So something changed in the last years yeah. or not? I guess yes. Is what I'm, I'm telling. What I'm saying. Uh, the moment is great because people are more aware about the culture, heritage. For sure, it has to do how we are how we are using the environment, how we are using the, the cultural heritage last year to the extreme. So we had uh, the problem with uh, we use or overuse of cultural heritage and overuse the environment. So people get more aware of that. And, and I guess in this area it would be interesting to have more people from the hotels here to, to see if it is a general idea of the creating this, uh, recreating this image or branding this area with another image in this uh, uh, summer holidays. For, uh, for the association of hotels yesterday, yeah. and if their strategy, vision, their ambition, because normally. There are conflicts between within hotels, the different clients, so there are the big hotels, the small ones, for example, there are different strategies. The small hotel has maybe more quality strategy because it doesn't need to have so many mm -hmm. uh, customers, but the big one has to attract and it gives with a, a large, uh, let's say, touristic operator, so international one. 
And yeah. again, when we say um, enterprise business, it's, it's not, not like people. It's every everyone has shared the same idea. Mm -hmm. So we have to to work with different ideas or different interests. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it's good to have some some association, some interest uh, interest association. So, uh, yeah. Yeah. This would be the good, good way to talk, for example, to the association of the hotels here. So. Yes, community private is also, really, for example, the great um, Coca-Cola, for example, that are changing the open space, the public space. Yeah. But what is the perception of the people uh, that are involved in this uh, in the formal planning when uh, Coca-Cola comes and change uh, the open space? Uh, and how they accept that no? yeah. because it's commercialization. Yes. Yeah. Yes. So about Coca-Cola, there is a clear example. Okay. Uh, we were changing the, the, the small ferries in electric ferries and we need uh, the budget. And the municipality eventually did not uh, have this big budget of changing the, the engine for being sustainable. And we were uh, from uh, from Berlin, we didn't care about you know this identity, and uh, we we had, we got the uh, sponsorship from uh, Coca Cola, yeah. and the mayor of uh, all the community of Berlin say no to Coca Cola. We don't want to see Coca Cola on our sector. But the other point is is good that some companies they put money where the environment is okay, where the, the cultural heritage is is intact. You know, okay. it's not in danger. So they associate their image with the environment, with green environment, with social culture. So if we have someone in this way, it would be perfect. Thank you. Okay, thank you all.